Welcome to uh, Center Beach Bible Church Middleweek Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Uh, we're up to Chapter Three, Part Six. Uh, the series is called Tomorrow's Newspaper Today, Part Twenty Four, meaning we've been in this study for twenty four weeks, and we are going to continue in the church in Philadelphia, Part Three of a four part sub series in Philadelphia. So got to keep track of all these parts and series. It's very complicated. Uh, but Jesus has a lot to say about the church in Philadelphia. There's a lot to study. So we're going to get into that, and we won't even finish that tonight. And then hopefully next week we'll finish it, plus show the historical videos we like to show about the church in Philadelphia. But before we do any of that, let's go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, and read... The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. Let's bow our heads in the word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you that we can be here. We can open up your word in a world full of lies. We can we can see truth, absolute truth. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, just give the winds a mighty voice and bless this study tonight and take it to the four corners of the galaxies and beyond. And if not there, take it to those who are listening online. And if not there, take it to those who are here in person. And if not there, take it to my heart. Lord, that we may learn and hear and grow and, and learn what we need to learn. We pray all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, don't forget if you're watching on YouTube to uh, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and, and like and comment on it. Uh, and this, I want to give a plug. We did our first filming today for redlining at RPM Critical with Tim Gaines uh, from Arizona. Uh, and uh, that's going to be edited and probably be up next week. So that'll be our, that's uh, redlining uh, our own news, not anything to do with the church. And I really want to clarify, uh, it has nothing to do with the Center Beach Bible Church. Uh, it's me and Pastor Jim. How about... Yeah, Thursday. It's going to be on a Thursday. Uh, we haven't decided on a time yet, but uh, we have our own little news network that, uh, that we have come up with called Redlining at RPM Critical. Uh, so uh, we, have, uh, we put together an hour show, and we have a lot of information, a lot of news, and uh, hopefully you guys will like it and subscribe to that channel. So check, uh, keep your eyes open for that as that is in the post-production process right now uh, as it's getting uh, edited. Okay, so uh, let's get to our news first. So we're going to drop the uh, screen down. We'll see what's going on in the news, and uh, we'll talk about that. We'll get back into the church in Philadelphia, and then we will. Uh, I'm going to show you a little short six-minute uh, video just... Not necessarily anything to do with our study, but a, a word of encouragement by David Wilkerson uh, that I, uh, I really enjoy. But let's see what we got here. Okay, January 24th, 2024, in the news from a biblical perspective. Uh, so uh, the, the president says uh, of the United States, only a matter of time before U.S. troops are killed in Iraq and Syria. Uh, they're just getting us ready because we're at war, people. Uh, soldiers don't get killed unless we're at war. So United States soldiers now, and many are getting deployed, uh, are going to be going to fight. The other day, another barrage of rockets and another spark from the American officials' fear could set off a wildfire of violence across the Middle East and then transition to the following astounding and frank admission. Whenever, uh, whenever a report of a strike arrives at the White House Situation Room, officials wonder whether this will be the one that forces a more decisive retaliation and results in a broader regional war. It's just moments uh, from that happening. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, this is really horrible. Uh, video game. Uh, uh, video game on the largest online platform pr promotes murder of Israelis. Uh, for some reason, I don't know what that thing is there for. I don't know. Uh, let's go back up there again. Okay. Let's see. Uh, okay, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, this 
Fuzon was launched in 2021, the world's largest digital gaming distribution platform. And early uh, December 23, the game received a gruesome update, one that follows and praises the October Hamas terrorist infiltration of Israel and the wholesale massacre, rape, torture, and abduction of Israeli citizens, 136 of whom are still being held hostage in Gaza. This game incites obscene and gratuitous violence against Israelis with a pro uh, protagonist whose goal is to murder uh, Israeli defense soldiers under the slogan, with bullets and blood, we will, flee, we will free Palestine, a known euf euphemism for the violent destruction of the state of Israel. Now, can you imagine if that was a video game that was targeting Asians or African Americans or Italians or anyone else? People would be up in arms. But they're instigating people to kill Jewish people in a video game. And no one's stopping it. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, bring this. Okay, uh, nuclear-armed Israel's war in Gaza keeps world on edge of doomsday clock. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, as they did last year, set the clock at 90 seconds to midnight. It's funny, they, the world has the doomsday clock. You know, we have our, uh, we have our, we have our, our own clock here, okay? That we have our own doomsday clock, but ours is more accurate. Um, uh, Min, uh, 90 seconds to midnight, the, the theoretical point of annihilation. Scientists set the clock based on existential risk to the earth and its people, nuclear threat, climate change, disruptive technologies such as artificial intelligence and new biotechnology. Okay, this next thing here, people, if you haven't heard about it, it's really going to scare you, but I'm just telling you, uh, they have a new disease coming out, uh, latest, disease X. Okay, it will kill you in eight days. You get it, eight days you're dead. All of the mice that were on yes. study all died. Yes, so the question is, okay, so Chinese lab mutant COVID-19 strain with a 100% kill rate. Everyone who gets it dies quickly, okay? Uh, in humanized mice, surprisingly rapid death. First of all, why are the scientists experimenting on a new virus? Why are they doing it? Why did they make the first virus? Because they want to, they want the population down. And you got to face the facts. Uh, Chinese scientists are experimenting with a mutant COVID-19 strain that is 100% lethal to humanized mice. The deadly virus known as GXPQV attacks the brains of mice that were engineered to reflect genetic makeup similar to people, according to a study shared last week out of Beijing. This underscores a spillover risk uh, into humans and provides a unique model for understanding the pathogens mechanisms of the SARS-CoV-2 related viruses, the authors wrote. All the mice that were infected with the virus died within just eight days, which researchers note was a surprisingly rapid death rate. Now, if you watch the RPM news, you'll, we go into it further. People, uh, the World Health Organization is already preparing for this. It's not even out yet, but they're already preparing for it. And it, it's a game changer. It's the end of humanity because you can't go to the hospital. There, you, who's going to run if everyone is dying and everyone, if people were afraid during COVID-19 to go out? You imagine if you get this, you die in eight days. Who's going to run the power plants? Who's going to, who's going to deliver the oil? Who's going to keep the infrastructure going? Everybody is going to be in a panic. And it makes me think about in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus says that men's hearts will be trembling with fear, looking upon the things that are falling upon the earth. And when I heard about this COVID X new disease, if that comes out and happens, okay, with the open borders and all the Chinese people coming over, you are going to see mass suicides. People are going to just, they're not going to be able to handle it. And what do you do? The hospitals are not going to want you because everyone's, there is no cure. There's no vaccine. There's nothing. So you get it, that you're over. That's it. So the question is, is why are they doing this for? Why? Okay. The book of Revelation tells us why. Okay. It's all in there. Do we have anything else? I think that was, I, I think that's enough news. That's enough. Okay. Can I just share one? That yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Exclusive. America's Friday New Bat Lab. 12 million taxpayer funded NIH research facility in Colorado will import bats from Asia and infect them with deadly diseases in project with China Lee scientists. Yeah. Uh -oh. So, you know. <laughs> didn't they learn? Yeah, th didn't they learn? Obviously, people. They, they want to get rid of humans for some reason. Uh, kill, you know, save the planet and, get, and kill the humans is, is the way to go here, uh, since we are the big prob biggest problem to them. But what does the Bible say? The biggest problem is not the planet. God's got the planet covered. The biggest problem is the humans. God says, I came to save you. And they're trying to save the planet by getting... Because what were they saying? Remember a couple of weeks ago, they were saying even us exhaling is is destroying the planet's protective uh, system and the ozone and all that stuff and causing green... So, so there'll be no humans on Earth, but the Earth will be okay. It's just insanity. It doesn't make sense, but the Bible makes sense because the Bible has this all down right to a T. And, and for those who, don't, uh, who, who haven't yet, read the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24... Read it from uh, verse 1, when the apostles asked Jesus, how do we know when we're at the end of the age? Jesus says, look for these things, wars and rumors of wars, and, and, and massive worldwide pandemics. The Bible talks about these. Not just one, but many of them. Now, should you be afraid? Not if you're a child of God. Not if you're a child of God. Because Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. People, remember, as a Christian, we don't fear death. Because what happens, remember, I always remember this, as a Christian you have a triple win-win situation. If God, because who decides whether you live or die? God does. God does, okay? So if you live, you get to serve God another day. If the rapture comes, He takes you up, you get to be with God. Okay? If you die, what happens? You get to be with God. And it's way better than down here. Okay? Just a little hint. It's way better. No more death, no more tears, no more sorrow. Make sure you're right with God. And I, you know what, when, when these things are going to come out, probably right around election time, they're going to start putting all of that, so everybody stays home and they want to do something with the election. Don't let the fear mongering, because what does the Bible say? God is not the author of fear. Okay? God is not the author of confusion. Okay? That's, that's from Satan. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Second uh, Timothy 1, seven, I think. Uh, the spirit of fear, and notice God calls the fear a spirit. There is a spirit of fear, and you know how people had it a couple of years back. Can you imagine what the fear level will be like? There'll be people jumping off of roofs. They'll be saying, that's it, I can't take it. I can't take it. They, not, they, they won't go anywhere. So uh, this could all be made up, too. It could all be just uh, lies, because who's the father of lies? Satan. He's a liar, a liar, a liar. We don't know if this stuff... We don't know what's true anymore. And then there'll be another vaccination, and then there'll be another thing, and we don't even know what to do with this stuff anymore. We just don't. So, but God does, so just don't worry about it. So this is where we left off last week. Uh, remember the church in Philadelphia? Jesus loves the church in Philadelphia. This is at Revelation chapter 3. Uh, Remember, the early church was made up with, of mostly Jewish people. And they were bringing in their, you know, religious practices. And it's hard to let go. It's hard to let go. How many times, I mean, many of us here come from basically probably the same religion background. If, if, you, if, if you're Italian and you live on Long Island, there's a, there's a good ch or Irish, there's a good chance you belong to a certain denomination. And, you know, I grew up in that, went through the whole thing, and uh, a lot of those things were, are hard to let go of. You've been taught your whole life, and when you're introduced to the Bible, it's hard, you know, and some people can't make the crossover, you know, but I was taught this, but the Bible says that, and, and it's the same thing with, with the Jewish people. They had a lot of traditions, 
a lot of things that they, that they wanted to bring into the church. So let's see what's going on. So some Jewish believers thought that becoming a Christian meant becoming more Jewish. Uh, this problem grew worse until the gospel of salvation without works became the norm. The faith-only message which Jesus provided was being crushed by religion. And it's always being crushed by religion. Remember, the gospel of Jesus Christ is by faith only. I mean, how many times will we say it? It has nothing to do with your goodness, your religious practice. If you could be good enough to go to heaven, then Jesus would not have to go to the cross and die. Understand that. Why did Jesus go to the cross and die? To pay for our sins. But if my sins are not paid for because I have to do A, B, C, D, E religious practices to atone for my sins, then what's the point? Jesus came to pay for the sins of the world and whoever accepts his payment is free from sin. You're forgiven. You don't need to be forgiven by me, by anybody. I have no power to forgive you. No man can forgive you. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, is what the Bible says. Jesus is the only mediator between the Father and humanity. No one else. But the religions today have other people in between there. If you guys get a chance, I know you guys, this group here doesn't always come, uh, you're not my evening service people, but if you try to watch this Sunday night's evening service, I'm really excited about put a lot of effort into it. We're in Psalm 135, and we're going to ask the question, are there other gods? Okay, And that's going to lead us to all the religions of the world, and uh, the question, are there other gods? Is there one God? How do we know there's just one God? And who is He? And how do we know He's really God? So if you're interested in that, that, the, that there is only one God, and you want to know, well, listen to that study, and it's called, Is There Only One God? Or How Many Gods? I think it's only one God. Uh, I think it's Psalm 135, Part 3. Uh, so the point here, Satan is always behind good deeds, salvation. Okay? You look at Hinduism, uh, Buddhism. A lot of, I mean, these religions are the good people. They're like all good vibes. Everything is good. You know, uh, 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 what what else is a good? Uh, I mean, there's just every religion is a good deeds religion, and you know it's interesting. Do you know it's been proven the most friendliest, nicest people? If we want to say, well, does a relate does a religion make you really nice? Do you know the religion that's voted the most nicest, kindest, godliest people? Mormonism. Okay, Mormons. Mormons are the friendliest, nicest people. Big problem, though. They're all going to hell. Okay, because Mormonism is a cult. It's a complete cult to the 10th degree. It is so bizarre. The Church of Latter-day Saints, that's the Mormons. Really bad. But they are so nice because they are trying to earn their way to heaven. So they are the most friendliest, helpful people. And you would say, hey, they're definitely going to heaven. Based on what? Well, they're very nice. But who said getting, being nice gets you to heaven? Not the Bible. Because if getting to heaven by being nice was the way to go, then Jesus would not have to go to the cross and die a brutal death. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right? He gave His life for, the sin, for our sins. And if we confess Him, our sins are covered. you just got to give up on this being good thing. You don't have to be baptized. Always remember, you know, God always grants us these great things. One of the greatest game changers, the smoking gun, is Jesus on the cross with the two thieves on the side. It really ends all the debates. Oh, you know, remember Christ is on the cross and he has, he has two criminals, one on either side. One of them goes to hell, one of them goes, to, goes with him to paradise, which is for another study what that actually means. What, what happened? Well, the guy who believed Christ 
Ask yourself the question, did he have a chance to do any good deeds? No. Did he have a chance to get baptized? No. Did he have a chance to help some old ladies across the street? No. Did he have a chance to do anything? All he did was believe. He didn't become this denomination or that denomination. He didn't get his first confirmation. He didn't get his bar mitzvah. None of those things. He didn't get circumcised. He believes and Jesus says, there you go, saved. It's so undisputable. But people seem to like, well, the reason why man comes up with religion is because religion brings control over the people. You know what? If, if, if we had a religion here and I told you, everybody here, you want God to bless your life, then you each better be giving me $100 each before you leave. You want happiness? You want health? And, and I want you to wash my car once a week? Okay? And treat me real good and I'll talk to God for you and I'll put in a good word. You know how many people basically do that? Okay, where do I sign up? Because it's easy. Okay, so I just give you $100, Pastor, and I'm good to go. Yeah, then I could go live my life any way I want, do anything, but I'm good to go because I gave that guy 100 bucks, And he says I'm good with God. It sounds simplistic, but isn't that what religion is? Okay, I'm good with God. I greased his palm. He greased mine. I, I always say it's like, a, it's like an Italian mob deal. You take care of my people. I take care of your people, okay? You do a little bit for me, I do a little bit for you. One hand washes the other, we both wash the face, you know? That's not, God is not a deal maker. The deal is, we're sinners, and we can't save ourselves. That's why he came to this earth in the form of a man. So, let's move on to the next one. So, what do we learn from verse 9? Some people who claim to be Christians might not. Wow, that's a, that's a, a, a hit in the face. But it's true. It's true. More today, how do we know? Because the Bible says, towards the end of the age, and we're going to learn in the last church, the Laodicean church, apostasy. Apostasy, there will be so much untruth taught in churches in the last days of the church that you, it'll be hard to find. It will be hard to find the church today. It is, people tell me all the time they're looking for churches. They're looking, they live in Arizona. They live here. Pastor, I can't find a church. Look, and you check out their statements of faith. They're all off the rails. I mean, there's not all. I can't say all. But very few. Because people don't like what God has to say. They like what these churches have to say. That it's all going to be okay if you just follow our religion. And it hasn't changed. So... What happens is, is you have people going to these churches. Some of you might know people who go to churches who serve their whole life in the church. Deacons and Sunday school teachers and they did this and they did that. They're not even saved. The Bible says some of the pastors are not even saved. Satan has ministers in the pulpits preaching who don't even know Jesus Christ. It's just the way it is. Some people believe they are saved, but are not. Acts 20, verse 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. Flock is the people, the Christians, over the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Okay, to feed... The, now, in Acts, uh, is written actually by Luke, uh, in case you didn't know that. This is an instruction to the overseers, the elders, the pastors. So it's telling them, Take heed unto yourselves, you leaders of the church, and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer. What's our job? Feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Wow, if that is so crystal clear. We're being warned that once the apostles all died off and Paul is gone, they're warning people are going to come into the church. They're not going to care about the sheep. They're going to raise up their own leaders with their own ideas 
And they're going to get people to follow them instead of Jesus Christ. What's the application for today? Well, watch who you put into leadership. Okay? We can, I mean, we don't even have to go there. You guys know that. The Bible says, do not be quick to lay hands on any man. Now, that scripture is not talking about beating someone up. It's talking about, do not be quick to put someone in the place of authority in the Bible. Laying hands, like, like when we install an elder, we lay hands on them and we pray over them and we you know, install them as an elder. We give them the, the commission, a pastor. God warns, don't be just throwing people into these positions. Well, we got nobody else. And trust me, in a little church like this, we've made these mistakes in the past where you have, well, we need some people to fill these positions. Uh, Bob, you look okay. Uh, you're breathing? You're walking? Seems like a nice guy. You become a leader. And trust me, I have, as a pastor, made that mistake out of desperation. And I'm going, what am I going to do? I don't know. Put this guy in. I don't know. You know. And the Bible also says, and I made this mistake, make sure their wives match the position. Make sure their wives are godly women. And one of the big mistakes I've made over and over again is not taking the wife into account. Okay, you have a great guy, but the wife is a gossip, busybody, troublemaker. So you put a, a, a good man in office and the wife is a nightmare. <laughs> She's just worries like, You know, and it's not anybody's fault. You know whose fault it is? It's my fault. It's my fault. Okay, and talking the elders into it, saying, trust me, guys, we've got to put this guy in. We've got no choice. Who's going to do it? Watch out who you put into leadership. We even know that as a nation. Watch who you put your trust in. Okay? I always talk about this. If you guys don't know our Bible here, I don't know if you guys can see it on the camera. We have a Bible up here, the church Bible. It's always open, in case you know, it's open to a specific place. It's open to the center of the Bible, the mathematical calculated, if you took the Bible verse by verse and you divided it in two, it ends up where? Psalm 118, verse 8. What is, and gee, what would the odds of this verse saying this? Put not your confidence in men, trust only in God. The main point, one of the main thrusts of God's word and warning to us, and why are we so slow to learn this? Don't put your faith in people. But they're great. How many times we put our faith in people, and they burn us, they hurt us, and we're all upset where God says, why are you building your life around a person? Now, it doesn't mean, you know, obviously you get married, you have people that you trust, that you have to have pastors and leaders and stuff, but don't Build your life around them. Don't ever say, without this person, I'm through. Without this person, I'm nothing. That's a danger. God says, don't do that. People are prone to let you down. You know why? Because they're sinners. We're all sinners. How many times have I told you guys, don't put your faith in me. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I should put a sticker on the back of my car. Don't put your faith in me. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Because I will definitely let you down. When people come to this church and they want to uh, take a membership class to become a member, it's what I tell them. First thing is, don't build your life around me. I promise you one thing. The longer you stay in this church, the better chance you have that one day I will let you down. You think I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to disappoint you somehow. So I'm letting you know right now, I'm going to disappoint you. Okay? Just trust in God. He won't. Okay? And how many churches they have, they worship their pastors. You know, it's, it's, it's not God said, it's, it's Pastor Bob said. Pastor Bob said this and Pastor Bob said that. Don't ever reach people with that. My church says this. No, say the Word of God says this. The Word of God says that. That's the dangers we fall into. And you know what God will do? What will God do if you build your life around a person and make them everything to you? He will bring them down. He will bring them down to teach you the lesson. Why did you build your life around 
someone. And I've, I've shared this story many times. It's, it's kind of funny. Standing right here many years ago, there was a young lady who was, uh, got married to this wonderful Christian man. And I remember talking to her right here. And, uh, and she was telling me after a church service, Pastor, I'm so happy. My husband is my rock. Remember those words? He is my rock. And I told her, I said, that's wonderful, but that's a bad thing to say. I know you got a great husband. I was at the wedding. It was wonderful. I said, but your husband cannot be your rock. There's only one rock, and that's Jesus Christ. This lady was just in love with this man, the most, go- and he was a godly, wonderful man, great job. The guy of her dreams, you know what happened? He had an affair, left her, and she never, to this day, if I haven't seen him in years, but never got over it. Devastated! Devastated! You wouldn't have been devastated if you didn't build your life around him. Infallible, perfect man that you worship. No! Okay? We are all prone to failure. Myself, myself too. I used, you know, when I, I used to belong to pastor groups and we used to have these big pastor meetings, all the pastors and the stuff. And, you know, every couple of months, there was always some pastor who got caught up in some kind of sexting thing or some type of affair with a secretary and who was stepping down because they got, they did something wrong. And, and, you know, all the pastors were going, oh boy, poor Bob, I can't believe he did that. But, you know, I tell you, you know what I was saying to myself? There, for the grace of God, go I. Could have been me that easy. Okay, you walk that line all the time. And all of us, if you think I can fall and get into some horrible thing, boy, if Satan wants to, he's going to go after me and destroy me. And I am not immune to that. Okay? I pray to God that that never happens. It'll be the most horrible thing. But to say, you guys just trust me, I will always be holy, righteous, and good. I can't promise you that. But I can promise you that Jesus Christ will always be holy, righteous, and good. Okay? Watch who you build your life around. Point. People aren't always what they seem. Hey, have you learned that? Right? The older we get, we're a bunch of old folks here, right? Most of us. I think we've all learned that lesson pretty. When you're young and you're a kid, remember when you're a kid, you know, like you're, like you're, you're playing out in front of your, uh, your street and you're drinking cherry coke and somebody drives walks by drinking cherry coke. You like cherry coke? I like cherry coke. Let's be best friends. And then you're like best friends and you're like friends and you're like, you make friends just like that. You learn as you get older. You get a little bit more skeptical, right? Gee, you're so skeptical and bitter. Well, you get burnt enough by people, you get bitter and skeptical. And you learn that Whose fault was it? When we get burned, many times it's us because we expect people to do what God would have them do, don't we? Don't expect people to do what God would have them do when we don't even do what God would have us do. We're expecting, I can't believe they did that to me. I can't believe they said that. Why can't you believe it? The heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? God does. Just be prepared Don't expect anything from anyone. Expect everything from God. And you'll never be disappointed. Friends might not really be friends. I think we've learned that one. Church friends might not really be church friends. I think we've learned that one. Only God will never let you down. Okay, Revelation 3, 9b, part b of that scripture. So Jesus continues talking to John about the church in Philadelphia. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. uh, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. That's a complicated scripture. That's kind of cryptic. What in the world is Jesus talking about? Who's going to worship at whose feet? Why will they worship at their feet? Well, let's break the scripture down. Point one, not even angels want to worship. uh, uh, Not even angels should be worshipped. In case you don't know this, Revelation 22, verses 8-9. Remember John, 
uh, he, you know, he, uh, he falls down because he, he's, he's in the presence of angels. And they say, don't you bow down before us. You, you don't bow down. How many people, and this is something you have to be careful about, people. You know, today we have this term called spiritual. Oh, you're a Christian? Oh, my friend Mary, she's spiritual too. No, you're, you're mixing things up. I'm a Christian, your friend's spiritual. Well, what spirits are they following? Okay, because I'm, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even think it's a good idea to call yourself spiritual because that would mean you're always walking in the Holy Spirit all the time. No, okay, I, people ask, what are you? A child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian, okay? Not perfect, but forgiven. Remember, Christians are not perfect, we're just forgiven. What's the difference between the world and a Bible-believing Christian? They're not forgiven. We are. We're just, we're all sinners, but we're forgiven sinners. Interesting. So, Jesus is pointing out some things that are going to come. No one should ever worship anyone or anything but the Lord alone. Exodus 20, uh, verse 3 to 5. What are the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other God before me. God gets that right off the bat. We're going to talk about that Sunday night. Right off the bat. And what do we do? We make other gods. And what do we do? We worship angels. Watch out. People, if you have a bunch of those little crystal angels all over your house, throw them away. Okay? Don't worship angels. Okay? It's, it's demonic. It's dangerous. Oh, I had an angel visit me. Angels ain't visiting you that you can see. Just forget it. If you had, I, I, I remember this one lady was on a Bible study. Uh, she, I was talking like this, and she was mad at me after the study. And she goes, you know, I have a bone to pick with you. She goes, I had, I had, I was at my bed, and I had this appearance of this angel, and and you're telling me I didn't see that. I said, no, I'm not telling you you didn't see that. I believe you saw it. I'm telling you that was not an angel. Just because you have a manifestation. And it's a spiritual, ultra-natural thing. Doesn't mean it's supernatural. And if I could coin a term here, supernatural is what God does. Ultra-natural is out of the natural, but not of God. So, I, and I told the lady, I said, you're basing on feeling what you saw. Well, I know what I saw. I believe you saw it. But what, how does that prove that that was of God? Because God is not hovering over your bed telling you, Mary, get up and do this and do that, and tomorrow play lotto number 6527. You know, people are looking for this thing. People are worshiping Mary. We know that's a, that's a major, major thing. Okay, What did Mary know about herself? She knew that she needed a Savior. She was honored to be a vessel used by God. And she said, My Lord... And my Savior, she needed a Savior. How many people believe that Mary is above Jesus? Well, they say, isn't Mary the mother of God? No. No. She's the mother of the humanity of Jesus. God the Father is, you know, and we all go through these, you know, people, they pray to Jude, they pray to St. Peter. God says there is one mediator between God and man, Jesus. Why not go directly to the top, okay? And by the way, all of these people, they all have one thing in common, they're sinners. Mary was a sinner. She knew she was a sinner. She has no power. She's not sitting in heaven right now next to the Father, directing things. The Pope has even said Mary's another way to... Yeah, well, they, they, the Pope calls Mary a co-redemptrix, meaning that she is actually... Above Jesus, you don't really need you because what's the you know and it's, when people use logic, well, if the mother of Jesus doesn't she know the son? I'll tell Mary. Mary will tell Jesus because she knows her son really well. Now, now just keep in mind. Now remember, Jesus makes this point clear. The first miracle Jesus does is turning water into wine at the in Cana at the wedding, and Jesus' his mother, now Jesus points this out twice, and she gets it right away, because she, Mary is at the wedding, and she's concerned, they ran out of wine, and she goes to Jesus, and Jesus says, woman, 
And when time does not come, basically shut up and sit down. And what does Mary do? Whatever he says, do it. Because she was telling Jesus, you got to do something. Jesus, don't you tell me what to do. Okay? Uh, when uh, there was another account where Jesus' family comes. Remember, Jesus had brothers and sisters. They come, and there's a crowd, and, the, and the, you know, the people say, Jesus, your family, your siblings, should we part the way and let them come in and get front row? Jesus says, who is my mother, my brother, my sister? But those who do the will of God. Jesus was clearly defining, okay? And people, Mary in the Bible, she is mentioned, and there's about seven different ladies named Mary, by the way, in the Bible, it was a common name. Mary, who birthed Jesus, she's mentioned very few times, and she fades away, and that's it. You don't hear about her. There's nothing really about her. She's very insignificant, but how many people build their lives around Mary? They're not getting to God. It's, a, it's an affront to God, based on Scripture. Saints, statues, Okay, idols, they're all strictly forbidden by God. What does God say in the commandments? Also, do not make any images of anything in heaven or on earth and bow down and worship them. How many churches have icons all over that people are bowing down to a statue? It's blasphemy against God's own word. Don't do it. People say, well, it's, it's just a picture of the person. And that's why, if you notice, in a Christian church, in case you didn't notice, a Christian church, we have a cross. We don't have a crucifix. Okay? A couple of reasons for that. Okay? Uh, a crucifix and a cro- uh, What's a crucifix? Jesus is hanging on the cross. A couple of important points. Is Jesus still hanging on the cross? No. no. What is the picture of victory? Jesus, and I've never seen the picture of a crucifix of Jesus. He looks like a defeated skeleton from the most horrible looking loser. The glory of salvation is Jesus is not on the cross. And the second problem is people bow down to a picture of Jesus. They want to touch it. It's, it's an image God says, do not do that. It is forbidden in the commandments. It is a danger. And I'll tell you something else. If we ever do another study on demonic activity, with every idol comes a demon. You have a statue of an idol, of any image around your home, I tell you, get rid of them. Just just get rid of them because they're like a... uh, They need a host to live in. They need a place to... To hover. Remember when Jesus runs into the man who was possessed with many demons? Remember him, he said, and Jesus says, who are you? He goes, what's your name? And he goes, we are many, we are legion. This man was filled with, and what, and they, and they said, Jesus, have you come before the day to deal with us? And what do they ask him? Jesus, send, if you're going to cast us out of this man, send us into the swine. Why do demons want to go into animals and people and objects? They need a place to dwell. Okay? They need a place to dwell. True story, when I was pastoring uh, my first church in California, a little country church, man, a lot of demonic stuff going on in that little town. Holy mackerels. That was my baptism by fire, I tell you, because I had to deal with a lot of occultic activities. And I remember this one family, they had a a witch living next door to them, big pentagram with a cauldron, the whole thing, and they were having, and they were a Christian family. They were a Christian family uh, that were coming to my little chapel that I had there in uh, California, and they were having all these bizarre things happening, and and even here, I, whenever people tell me some weird things are going on in their homes, uh, but especially when I was in California, it happened a lot. And I would say, well, tell me about your home. What's going on? What's coming in? And I would go to some of these places and pray through them. But what I found out is the daughter of the lady who was there, she was coming and she was taking little stones when she would visit and place them on the ground in different areas. Okay? Why would she do that? 
to have a dwelling place for the demons who were going to live, who were oppressing this family. And when I found out that's what was going on, we started to look around and we found all these things. And I said, that your little young girl who's coming over, who is very, she had the, she had the Jezebel spirit. So like 16 year old girl was going after the father of the house and trying to inf- infiltrate the family. And I said, when they, when they told me, I said, hold on here. And I said, Let, let's go look at your house. And we found out that this girl was placing things. I said, we've got to get all of these things out there. And I went through that house, and we all prayed through that whole house and said, Father in heaven, clean this place out. And then all those manifestations stopped. So that's for another study, and I know it sounds bizarre and cryptic, but I can tell you stories, people, about demonic things that will blow your mind. It's real. And... Just be careful with idols and idol worship and any crystals. Everybody's big into crystals now. Those little crystal things you hang from your rearview mirror. Just get rid of them because they're a spiritual thing. What is it? Dream catchers. Uh, uh, just get rid of them. You don't need anything like that. You, know, who, you got enough trouble in your home these days, right? I don't need anything else. Just get rid of it. And... Uh, you don't need those things, okay? So idols are strictly forbidden by God, okay? Okay, God is passionate about this, okay? Exodus 20, verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, okay? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness. Now this is God speaking to Moses. Shall not, shall not. These are the big ten here. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. What's that? It's an image of something in heaven. God says, they're not even of me. Not even of Jesus. No one. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Do you know people bowing down to statues anywhere? Have you ever seen people bowing down and praying to a statue? all over the place. It's the greatest insult to God. Okay? Can you imagine if you're, if you're married to someone and you see your spouse bowing down to some lady or some man and say, what are you, what are you doing? Well, I'm just admiring them. No, I, I think I'd be upset. Okay? No bowing down to anyone. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that, and this is interesting, hate me. God talks about those who hate him. It's amazing how many times he mentions it. God says, there are billions of people who hate me. They hate me. And these people who are bowing down, they hate God. And they don't even know it. And it's, it's, and who's to blame? It's out of ignorance because their leaders are teaching them these things that they've been taught, not from the Word of God, but through a religious denomination of what they came up with. So Jesus is passionate about this also. In 1 Timothy 2.5, He says, for there is one God, here's the scripture, and one mediator. What's a mediator? It's the the go-between, okay? This This is probably, this is an amazing scripture. For anyone who worships anything other than God the Father, this blows everything out of the water. 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God. We'll learn that Sunday, uh, Sunday night. And one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ, Jesus. He is the only go-between. Don't worship or go through anyone but Jesus Christ. He's called the way, right? He is the way. The truth and the life. But let's get back to this. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So answer to part one here. These false religious leaders secretly wanted to be worshipped. Oh, is that a new thing? 
Are there leaders in the church who want to be worshipped? Yep. Are there some religions where people want to kiss the hand of some person who is of a head, right? And you see they kiss the sacred ring. You know, people, and this is a true thing, I know human nature. And you know what? There's a part of me that when people really love on me and say, Pastor, you're such a great God, we love you, I kind of like it. It, it goes to a, an evil part of your soul. That's why, you, you know, you look at people like, you know, I, I watched a special on Elvis Presley, His Last Days, and Michael Jackson. How do you stay normal? When people want to touch you, when people call you the king, you cannot be normal. And after a while, you start to think you are a king. Michael Jackson was the king of pop. Uh, Elvis Presley was the king of rock and roll. And people actually call them kings. And, and these people, they, want, they lost their minds. Yeah, yeah. people would, would, would swoon in, in front of them. The girls, oh, you know. People, it's a dangerous thing, and that's why when you start to worship, I don't think anybody worships me, but when you, when you compliment a person, it, isn't it a dangerous thing? Can it start to, if, if I hear every day I go, let's just say, you know, a month goes by, everywhere in town I go, people go, there's that guy, there's guy. he's the greatest guy. We want to touch you. I tell you, I would not be able to be humble. I would start to go, wow. I started walking around a little cocky. People start banging on the doors. We've got to see Pastor Scott. We want to, we want to, we want to kiss his feet. <laughs> I am somebody. People, you know, and it would happen to you too. It would happen to you too. It doesn't matter who, you, you, you start, well, I guess I'm, I must be pretty good. Okay? So, so answer to part one. These false religious leaders secretly wanted to be worshipped. It's human nature. We all love to be, you know, worship is a big word for loved. Okay? I love people to think I'm great. You know, it's, it's, it's what we... Does anybody want people to think they're, they're horrible? I hope everybody hates me everywhere I go. No, you, no one thinks that. You want people to love you. And that's why when they don't, it hurts. We have in us, what, why did Satan fall? Right? He wanted to be worshipped. Pride. He was jealous that everyone worshipped God. He goes, I want to be God. And what does it, when, when you want to be worshipped, and, and I don't care what denomination, even in the Christian churches, you see some of these pastors, they sit on thrones up in the front, and they got gold and all kinds of stuff, and they just love it when the people just go crazy over them. Yeah, they, they throw money at their feet. They're, just, they're infallible. And then you start to think, I am something. So all false leaders desire to be worshipped that is their driving force. We all, to some degree, desire to be looked up to. It's really normal. Part two, instead of these false leaders getting what they wanted, God turned it upside down. They would be not above anyone, but instead, if anything, below God's true, true children. Our enemies will never bow down to worship us, but they will bow down to worship Christ, like it or not. Those people who look to be worshipped, God says, one day I'm going to turn it around. Okay? They who wanted to be worshipped will realize that I was the only one to be worshipped. And you, remember David says in Psalm 23, you will sit at me at my table in the presence of, of your enemies. God was going to deal with these people. A lesson for us today, don't be discouraged when your enemies seem to be doing better than you. Isn't that hard? I hate it when people I don't like are doing better than me. <laughs> they got a better car. They got a better car, better church, better everything. You know, don't, I remember going to all the pastor meetings I used to go to, and I, I always had the smallest church, and I was always like, oh, have, I'll have my secretary call your secretary or my assistant pastor, and how about you? Uh, I don't get any of those things. <laughs> yeah, you just call me. Just call me direct. 
just call me direct. I got no secretary. I got no assistant pastor. I, I don't have a receptionist. I don't have this. I don't have any. And I, and I felt like this small. Every time I go, I leave there, I feel like, man, I'm just like the lowest of the low. And uh, you have, uh, have your people call my people. You know, uh, I'll make an appointment to talk to you. Uh, don't ever worship anyone or, or thing but the Lord God Jesus Christ. Watch out for those who want to be praised and followed. Some people, they need praise. They yearn for it. And sometimes as a pastor, I know people who are, have a low self-esteem. And it's okay, because the Bible says, let another man praise you, but not yourself. And it's okay if someone does something well. You should encourage them. And, and I'll make a point. I know Brother So-and-so he really needs a pat on the back. He really struggles. So I say, you did a great job there. Really good job. But when the people start to demand it, you know, you didn't thank me for that, Pastor. You didn't, you didn't praise me for that. They yearn for that because the true service are those who say, and I know the people in the church, they don't need any praise, no, no pats on the back. They just secretly, they serve God. God gets the glory. And it's hard because we all like to be, you know, part of that. A, a true story. When I was a deacon in the church, because I, you know, I started just from somebody walking through that door of, that, of this church, Back in 1985, I guess, or 84. And I just, you know, went up the ladder and I, and I was a deacon. But I remember when I was working around the church doing, I was, I was always here doing stuff. And I always hoped that the pastor, because the pastor didn't live in the house like I do in the back. He lived in another house. And I would always feel great when he would show up by accident and I'd be there working. You know? It's like I hated when I did stuff at church and no one saw me. Man, I'll stay a little longer, kiss somebody drives by and just, I'm working over here. You know, and and I, and, and I'm being, I'm not even exaggerating. It's true. I would feel like, oh, the pastor showed up and he he goes, hey, how you doing, Scott? Good job. Uh, thanks for fixing that. And I was like, yeah, that's right. That's me. I fixed that for you. <laughs> it, it's, it's just what we need. It's, it's so funny. Uh, uh, number four, God will always avenge his children. What do we want to do? I'm going to get back at them. I'm going to show them how they hurt me. God says, don't. Vengeance is mine. God says, you're taking my position when you decide to get back at someone. You really are. God says, leave that alone, unless you want to be God. Okay? Not everyone's intentions are godly, though they appear that way. We've learned that many, many times. Uh, Next week, Revelation 3.10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast that which thou hast, that no man takes thy crown. Let's quickly, I, I know we're out of time, but I, I got a six minutes. You guys got six minutes? Let's, uh, let's show that video. I just love David Wilkinson from Times Square Church, passed away. But this is a, this is a great word of his and worthy of uh, hearing it again. the intensity of the men of God. I wonder where they get that spiritual authority and where they get this Holy Ghost stamina to do what they did for a prophet to lay for 365 days on his side warning Jerusalem for coming judgment. 365 days laying on his side. I, I read of these men that fast 40 days and 40 nights. I can't fast three. I, I, I read of men that are so burdened with the burden of God and so incensed against the sin against God's nature that they can pull clumps out of their beard and clumps out of their hair. I, I'm amazed at, at, at 
men who can weep and cry and mourn for two or three weeks at a time on their face. You know food, no water, and mourn and grieve for the heart of God. And I read those stories and I say, God, those are men of love and sorrow. I, I don't know what that's like. And, and, and then the thing that troubles me is that God says that these things have been put in the Word as examples for us by whom the ends of the world have come. That, that these, these men were men of like passion. There, was, there, was, there were patterns, there was something in them that God did that, that, laid, that what caused God to lay His hands on them. Our present generation is probably the, the, without a doubt the most wicked of all times, many more times wicked than, than Sodom and Gomorrah and Nineveh. If there's ever a time that people, or nations and churches and the society needed men of such intensity, it's now. Why would God arbitrarily raise up men, men of another sort who had this passion, who were able to do incredible exploits in understanding the heart of God and showing the heart of God to nations and brought them to repentance through their actions. And I, I say to myself, God, would you arbitrarily, all, all the way from church history, all the way back to Abraham, go all the way back, and God would raise up prophets and God would raise up men and raise up women with such an anointing that they would bring the whole society to their knees back to God. And why would God suddenly in these last days, when we need him more than any other generation, not raise up men and women as such? I think it obligates us. Now I'm not speaking just about preachers, but every every member of every congregation, everyone who calls himself by the name of Jesus Christ, to search the word of God out and find the patterns how these men became men of another sort? How, why did God touch them? Why did God anoint them? Why did God use them? Why did the words not fall to the ground? And why were they so marvelously changed by the power of the hands of God? Little hidden secrets about being touched by God. There are no hidden secrets. You can study the Word of God and find the patterns, find the way in which men were touched by the hand of God and follow that path. I'm not that kind of man, but I, I, I want to be a man of another sort. A, a man touched by the hand of God. Where even the enemies of the Lord know that there is a spiritual authority. And know that there has been something that comes from the throne of God's heart. But considering Ezra, first of all, the Bible said a man so wicked his entire nation. He said it gave the man with the hand of God on him. Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, to practice it. He set his heart. This was a conscious decision. One day he said, I am going to be a man of the Word. I'm going to go to the Word. I'm going to travel by it. I'm going to act on everything I read.
preparing the heart to seek the Lord. It's powerful stuff, David Wilkinson there. And uh, it's calling all of us. That's a call, you know, where are these people today? Where are we? Ah, let someone else do it. I'm too busy. Uh, I got to... I gotta go to the laundry mat. You know, just God is placing. If there's any a time, there's it's now to stand up, rise up, and say, uh, I'm gonna be a woman of God. I'm gonna be a man of God, and I'm gonna stand for the word of God, and I'm gonna be a person of another sort. Uh, and believe me, you'll stand out. You definitely will. And believe me, you'll take hits like you've never had before, and it'll be hard, but. Uh, through the power of God's Holy Spirit, uh, one person can change a family, a city, a town, a nation. And it's only with the Word of God and uh, passionate stuff. I love listening to him talk. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you, Lord. And, and we pray, Father, that you would rise up and just put that burden upon us, Lord. There's no special, you know, water I got to sprinkle on anybody or do anything. We just got to say, God, use me. Here I am. I want that, Lord. I want to be a person of the Word. That your Word is my rising and my setting. It is, it is everything to me, Lord. And if I lose friends, so be it. If, if uh, I gain enemies, so be it. But let me humbly serve you. Uh, let it not go to my head and start thinking, well, I'm a man of the Word. Or I'm a woman of the Word now, so you better watch out. Watch out for that pride, too, which can come up even in this service. And uh, poke us, Lord. Poke us, Lord, to be that. We, the darker it gets, uh, the smaller our light has to be to make a big impact. We don't need to be that bright. Just a little bit of light in a dark room shines a lot of light. And if we can just bring that to our workplace, to our schools, to our homes, to our neighborhoods, wherever we go, be that person, not just in word, but in action. People are going to notice. They're going to take notice. And more importantly, God is going to notice. And God will raise you up and use you in ways that you've never imagined. May we uh, be these type of people. I, I am certainly not, as, as David said, he's certainly not. But he really is, and he's being humble. He, uh, he was a man of another sort when he went to those gangs of New York City. He truly was. Uh, but he's a humble man. Uh, we thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.